Welcome to Mazandercast, a Persian podcast about myth, magic, and mastochiar. I'm your co-host, Sarah. And I'm your co-host, Seth. We're glad you're here with us for another episode, so get your tea. Or your coffee. Maybe some snacks while you're at it. And let the adventure begin. So, Seth, today's episode is going to be all about the biggest holiday in Persian culture. The Which holiday is, of course, Noruz! Noruz. <laughs> and if you remember in our last Shanama episode, we said that Jamshid was the one who started this holiday. Of course, this is all according to the Shanameh. Let's remember that this is a mythological story, not accurate. All, all to celebrate how good things were going. <laughs> Just to celebrate how good things were going. But actually, that's not really what Noruz is all about. Let me, let me start off by saying this is a huge, huge deal in uh, Persian culture, but not just Persian culture. This is actually something that's celebrated in several countries. Oh, really? Yes. But uh, let's back it up a little bit. So, Noruz is not a Persian holiday. It was actually a Zoroastrian holiday, but many people of different faiths and countries celebrate it today. Um, so, I told you that several countries are celebrating it. The UN even recognized it as an international holiday in 2010. They finally caught up. Hmm. So, with it being as huge and ginormous, um, I got a question for you, Seth. When do you celebrate the New Year? The New New Year's Eve is on December 31st every year, mm -hmm. and New Year's Day is January 1st. Why? So I did a little research prior to this episode. Yeah, and... because me, I'm like, what's so special about January 1st? Is it is it the first day of it... the new moon? You know, it, is let, it, let me go ahead and tell you, it doesn't line up with anything that makes sense. It lines up <laughs> with Julius Caesar and like the the rotation of his uh, his officers in, in politics. It was an entirely a political thing. January first is the day that uh, I forget what their position was, but there were these there were these really big deal guys in the Roman Empire who started their terms for one year starting on January 1st. And it's called January because of the god of new beginnings in the Roman Empire, Janus. So there's really nothing relevant to it other than just, here's this will make it easier for us to know when, when these guys need to be booted out and reelected. And you're telling me this is what the majority of the world follows, is this stupid political Roman date. Oh, I mean, it gets even weirder. Like, the, it's not even necessarily... The history of, of the Gregorian calendar is, is really odd, but that, this isn't a podcast devoted to that. You're right, it makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense, and frankly, y'all are stupid! <laughs> Sorry, that's going a little bit over. I'm just going to back it up and tell you that um, Noruz is actually the Persian New Year, and we've set it up on the day that it kind of makes the most logical sense to start a new year, an actual natural new beginning. First day of spring. The solstice? It's kind of, yeah. It's, or well, equinox, that's the it. The equinox in particular, yeah. So, you know, the other thing is that what do we do for New Year's on January 1st? What What is it that you and I and most people in America usually end up doing? We stay up till midnight, right? Oh, oh, that. Yeah, we stay up till midnight on December 31st. Yeah. Um, drinking is involved. Yes, that was the <laughs> thing I was going to say. Uh, people will occasionally set off fireworks, right? A lot. A uh, lot of fireworks. We, I used to do it all the time. Yeah, we, we let them off uh, at my, at my parents, like house. parents' house. Yeah. That was, that, that almost got dangerous. <laughs> 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 so that's nice. Um, is that all that we do? That's dumb, in my mm. opinion. I mean, <laughs> it's we, new beginnings. You, sometimes you watch TV to see if uh, the big balls come down on on uh, Times Square, Ooh. and everybody counts down at the same time. So exciting! Ten, nine, yeah. 
So I am going to keep ragging on it because our New Year's, according to the Gregorian calendar, is nothing compared to how we celebrate New Year on uh, for Noruz. The Persian New Year, it starts on the first day of spring, and it's more than just setting off fireworks and drinking and singing a weird song that no one knows the lyrics to. <laughs> In all the greatest, la la la. You actually la, la, know the lyrics to that song, wow. And all the quaint kids be forgot, and I don't know the rest of it. Do you know the rest of it? I don't even know the song, hardly. But I we know, know the it's the New Year's it. song, yeah. right? Should all the acquaintance be forgot? Blah, 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 blah. 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 <laughs> so, Noruz is like a bunch of holidays all mashed into one big event. There's a lot of uh, New Year's we celebrate here in the West, particularly here in the U.S., that actually they all kind of tie into things that Noruz does. So, tell me... I have a question for you. We're going we're gonna to make a guess. We're going to turn this into a game. I want you to list uh, some American holidays that you think might show up as we talk about Noruz. Uh, Easter. Okay. Um, Arbor Day. Okay. Christmas. Okay. Of course, New Year's. Mm-hmm. Naturally. Um, Naturally. Hmm. That's it, pretty much. Okay. I'm going to tell you there's way more than that, hmm. but we'll get into it. So besides all the celebrations, you were talking about earlier how we celebrate the new year according to the Gregorian calendar when the clock strikes 12, right? Mm -hmm. So Noruz actually gets more specific than that. Noruz begins the new year at precisely the moment the sun crosses into the celestial equator. And that time alters. It could happen, you know, depending on where you are in the world, it could happen at four in the morning. It could happen in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, so it all depends on where you are on, on Earth when the sun reaches that spot. So everybody gets it at the same time. Yes. So Japan and Australia can't jump into the future like they do every <laughs> year with the Gregorian calendar. We're all exploring this at the same time. Um but you can't just celebrate that one day. There's a lot you have to do in the days leading up to it. So three weeks before the start of the new year, you got to do your spring cleaning. And we call this Hune Tekuni. Hune Tekuni. That, that was actually pretty good. Um, and this is basically, Hune Tekuni literally means you're shaking the house. And you're basically cleaning it. This is the most thorough cleaning you do. You're scrubbing everything down from top to bottom. And the whole idea is you're trying to get all the negative energy out of your house that's built up over that year. And uh, we did this. You saw. I gave you a hard time with it. <laughs> we scrubbed everything in our teeny tiny apartment. Every little bit. Every bit. We washed Dusted the Dusted all the, the th figures on the... On the shelves. Dusted our figures. Dusted all our books. It was, it yeah. was pretty maddening. Scrub the kitchen, clean the oven, all that good stuff. Imagine if we had a big old house. Yeah. When we have a big <laughs> old house, Hune Tekuni might have to start a month beforehand. Oh, yeah. We'll see. Um, another thing you need to do before the new year is buy new clothes, and you'll wear these clothes on the first day of the new year. Get some new duds for the new year. Yeah, you, you got to get something fresh. Um, and then there's Char Shambe Suri, the eve of the last Wednesday of the year. So on the last Tuesday before the new year, everyone jumps over bonfires to burn away the bad luck and receive the good luck. So that Sounds dangerous. Sounds dangerous. Sounds cool. Now, why do you think it's so important we're jumping over fire of all things? Uh, because fire is sacred, of course. Yeah, you remembered. <laughs> so with fire being sacred... It's good for getting rid of all the bad luck and all the bad omens and the bad health that Ahriman might have placed on you over the year. All the evil in the year that's accumulated like a sludge on yeah. your shoes, I guess. On all of you. Your, you gotta burn. You, you gotta burn it off. You gotta so. let a Hura Mazda laser <laughs> laser strike all that off you. <laughs> sure, sure. Get that out of here. So you jump over the fires multiple times, and you'll say, "This is what it sounds like." Zardia man as to Zardia to as man. Good. Um, and that basically translates to my yellowness to you, 
your redness to me. The yellow in this phrase represents the bad luck and the bad health. The sickness. The sickness. And <laughs> the red represents good luck and good health. So you are receiving good luck and good health to start off your new year. Um, now, I've only ever celebrated it here in the U.S. And jumping over fires is the extent of what we do. There's been a couple of occasions where the Iranians let off some firecrackers and fireworks, but that's normally not smiled upon by by most Western culture because they're like, why are you setting off fireworks when it's not <laughs> Fourth of July or, uh, or or New Year's? But over in Iran, they get very crazy with it. There are a lot of firecrackers and stuff. And this is where I say that Noruz is like Fourth of July because we do have a big fireworks display. And I guess it is also kind of like our New Year's as well. I guess I didn't know that. We uh, we don't typically do fireworks for our Nauru's. Yeah. There's also something else that they do over in Iran and other countries that we don't do here. Kids will dress up in costumes and bang on spoons and pots as they go around to the neighbor's doors asking for sweets and snacks. Oh, what? It's Halloween too? It's Halloween too. Wow. Now, I don't know if they dress up as anything scary in particular. I think they're just dressing up. What? Uh, that's like half the fun. I know, right? <laughs> um, that way your neighbors don't know it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I want candy. Give. Give. I don't know. I don't know if there's a phrase for it either because, you know, over here in the U.S. Trick or treat. Smell my feet. Give, Give me, me something, something good, good to eat. eat. I've never said those other parts to any of the neighbors because I'd like to be polite. I just say trick or treat. I always said it every time. <laughs> it's charming coming from a little kid. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Smell my feet. Smell no, my feet, Mr. You. Adult. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> now here's another cool thing. Um, I've never shared this with you, but there's actually a way of doing some fortune telling by listening to passerby conversations. And you can do this after Char Shambhe Suri is over. So what you do is you ask a question in your head or you make a wish, you know, you, you just have that idea or that wish in your thoughts. Then you go out in public, like maybe on the corner of a sidewalk or behind a wall and you listen to people's passing conversations. And apparently whatever they say will be able, will be the answer to your question or your wish. Oh, it'll be like cryptically applicable because fate <laughs> has sent you an answer on this of the day of uh, the new year. I don't know, man. I'm not that superstitious. So I just, I don't believe in this stuff. And I, I only know of it because I did a little research on the internet and that's how I knew about, it's, it's called Falgush. And uh, I come from a, a family that is not very superstitious, so I didn't learn about it. Sounds like just eavesdropping. It sounds like a good excuse to eavesdrop <laughs> on people. Oh, I just wanted to know what my fortune would be. Uh-huh. Now, could you could you move your bank account password a little closer? <laughs> That's not how it... People don't <laughs> Mr. say their President? bank accounts... Oh, my God. People don't say their bank accounts out loud, and that wouldn't be falgush. That would be stupidity on whoever's just saying their bank account numbers out loud. Um, so here's the next thing we're going to talk about. We've talked about how Noruz is like... Uh, our New Year's, it's like 4th of July, it's like Halloween, and the biggest one is, uh, the, the biggest holiday that you can compare Noruz to is one of the biggest holidays over here. What's the biggest holiday over here? Christmas! Christmas. And we are, have so many things in common with Christmas, it's ridiculous. So, um, what are some of the things you do for Christmas, Seth? Exchange gifts. Exchange gifts. Eat too much <laughs> watch christmas movies sarah are there noru's movies oh my gosh that's a good question we have to look we'll figure that out for the next episode we should look up some noru's movies if there are noru's movies i know there are noru's songs because you and i listen to like a, a million of them oh yeah there are so many noru songs it's ridiculous but if there's a move is there a there should be a hallmark channel devoted to noru's <laughs> movies <laughs> Hallmark is for white people, though. <laughs> That's why we have to do it. We have, to, we have to stop making it so white. <laughs> All right. Um, now, now, going back to Christmas, um, what is the big thing that y'all set up for Christmas? A Christmas tree. Y'all set up a Christmas tree, exactly. We don't set up a Christmas tree, but we do set up something in relation to the holiday. It's called a half scene. 
Hafzin means seven S's. So we decorate a table and we place at least seven items on it. And all the items that you put on there, they represent different things that you would wish for in the new year. So things that represent new life, new beginnings. And a new car, right? Yes, just put a giant car on top of your no, table. No, no, not a giant car. A Hot Wheel of whatever I want, right? No. Oh, that's, not, yeah. that's not what they did in the old days. <laughs> so we're not doing it here. Well, well they, their, their imagination was a little more limited. Jam she did not invent Hot Wheels, so they couldn't put it on the he table. He did invent a cup that gives immortality. Well, that wasn't on the table either. <laughs> so... <clears throat> As I told you, seven S's, seven of your items start with the letter S in the Persian language. So first things first, you set out a very pretty tablecloth. Then you set up your items. In the very middle, you have a mirror and candles. And a lot of Persians will use the mirror and candelabras that they had in their wedding ceremony. And we'll talk about wedding ceremonies in another episode. The mirror represents self-reflection. And the candles represent enlightenment and happiness. And again fire you gotta have that sacred symbolism on your table it's got to be there so ahura is close <laughs> all right so we have set up a half scene ourselves a few times a yeah. few times i'm gonna quiz you now husband i'm gonna see if you can remember some of the items that we put on the table oh no okay um at like the Persian words? No, no, no. I won't be that cruel. Oh, okay. Apples, See. eggs, fish, wheatgrass. Uh-huh. Uh, that stuff that looks like chocolate pudding. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The the, the two nuts that come out of the lotus flower. <laughs> um, ooh. Coins. <laughs> uh, did I say fish already? You did say fish. The goldfish, yeah. Uh, the goldfish. Good job. You named seven items, but not all of those start with S. It's okay. We're here to learn. It's fine. <laughs> there's the spice sumac. I yes, think. there you go. Is is that spice? I don't know. It it is a spice. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned the wheatgrass. Very good job. That's called sabze. sabze. Yeah. You grow it on a plate, and sometimes people will wrap a little ribbon on it to make it look cute. And sometimes you chop it up and put it into rice, and it tastes real good. Yeah, uh, you'll actually chop it up and make the, the wheat pudding. Um, that's also one of the seven S's. Oh, the brown stuff. Okay. The brown stuff, yeah. We'll get to that in a little bit. But sabze represents rebirth of nature. And, of course, this is because this is the time that everything's growing back around us. Now, this is one you missed. Jar of vinegar. Vinegar. Oh, yeah, the apple cider vinegar stuff. <laughs> we put in apple cider vinegar. It's called serke, and it represents wisdom and patience. You want these things for the new year. Apples, you remember that. They're called seeb in Farsi, and they represent beauty. Then sumac, or we call it somag. That's that red spice. Very good on kebabs. So good on kebabs. Ooh. Uh, it's the color of the sunrise, and it represents the start of a new day and a new time. And then Senjed are those uh, lotus tree fruits, also known as oleaster or Russian olives. Those are very hard to come by. So I used to bum off of my mom for a lot of these items and just be like, Mom, do you have some extra Senjed or some extra Sabanu I can put on my table? And she'd just give it to me. But since I don't live near my mom anymore... I had to go find that on my own. It was very <laughs> difficult to come by. Um, I'm sorry to pull you away from your personal grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I never realized how much I relied on my mom on until this. We love you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> love you, mom. Um, Sanjed represents love. Garlic is another one that we put on there. I'm surprised you didn't mention the garlic. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. Garlic is called seer. It represents medicine and good health. And the vampire last... warding. <laughs> vampire warding. Vampires hate noodles. <laughs> the last one is the wheat pudding that I had brought up before called the samanu. And um, it's not really a pudding. It's more like a paste and it's really, really sweet goes fantastically with tea. It's so good. It is so delicious. Um, 
I've never made it myself. I usually bum off of my mom or one of her friends. It looks so. just like chocolate pudding. <laughs> but it doesn't taste like chocolate pudding. It does pudding. not taste like chocolate pudding. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, goldfish and coins. Those are also included on there, even though they're not the original seven. So fish is just called mahi. Coins are called seke. Um, seke is, represents wealth. That's kind of obvious. And uh, the fish is supposed to represent life. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you. The fish kind of freaked me out because what happens? It, it, the fish represents life. What happens to goldfish usually for most people? They die within 15 days of you owning them because yeah, you don't take care of them sometimes correctly. Sometimes just 10, 5, 2 days. <laughs> what happens when the fish that's supposed to represent new life for the new year dies on your half scene table? Like, is that a bad omen? Is this why all of our goldfish live for like 5 years? I've, I've just become a pro at it, man. <laughs> you gotta but, keep it alive at no, all there, costs. There have been years where the Norus fish died before Norus came, and oh. I was like, is this a bad omen? Oh. Or is it just that the pH in the water is too high? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, you and your mom are both really good at taking care of goldfish. Okay, that might have been because I was slightly superstitious about the fish dying before <laughs> Norus. <laughs> We've had our same Noru's fish for the past four years? I don't know. Mei Mei has lived for a very long time. Yeah. I'm very I proud of her for lasting now. this long. I was still in college when uh, when we got Mei Mei. So I will say this. Um, some people are, are actually concerned for how Noru's fish are treated after the holiday. So in Iran, a lot of people will just dump the fish in rivers or find other ways to get rid of them. Uh, so a lot of folks are turning to these special bowls where artists have placed plastic fish in clear resin, and people will use them instead. Yeah, we've got one of those. Yeah, I actually um, asked my cousin to help me pick out one uh, before I left Iran for my last trip. Hmm. And so that's on there. So I'm glad Mei Mei's around. I hope she'll continue to be our Noru's fish. But if the day comes where she does pass away, uh, we're going to stick with that little little bowl she'll with be the fish. last noru's fish in our family well you have to understand we have two cats and we're trying to keep may may alive around those two cats as well so that's a story for another time yes uh i almost skipped this other one but there's a special flower that people will put on their half scene as well son bowl it's oh, the yeah. hyacinth mm -hmm. um and hyacinths are sometimes hard to find some people will put tulips instead but the smell of a hyacinth is so nice and very very spring flower very spring flower i will say they're so temperamental to the weather and us living in the south it's so hard to have consistent weather so very rarely can you find a hyacinth to be ready in time for noruz specifically yeah, and even when you do get them, it seems like they fade out pretty quick. They do. They do, yes. The instant you bring them to your home, <laughs> they just don't care they for it. They start wilting. They smell nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned eggs. Mm -hmm. There are eggs on the half scene table. We decorate eggs and place them on there. We decorated our last ones like Easter eggs. Yes, we did. Actually, in, in my family, too. We just decorate them like Easter eggs, and we keep them around until Easter comes around. <laughs> So there, this is another way that Noruz is like another holiday. It's like Easter because we have colorful eggs. Mm -hmm. And those eggs represent the rebirth of spring. Not the rebirth of Jesus. This is a Zoroastrian religion. Jesus wasn't even around when Zoroastrian cropped up. <laughs> and then the last thing that people will usually put on there, they'll put some sort of book of wisdom on the half scene. So if you're religious... You might put your religious book there, but a lot of Persians will also put a book of poetry, like by Hafez, and the Shahnameh is also an option. Our Shahnameh is way too big, so I couldn't, I couldn't let it sit on that little table I had, so I just hmm. put my book of Hafez out. So another way that Noruz is similar to Christmas is we also have an old man with a large bag of gifts to give to small oh, children. Oh, what? You guys have a Santa? We have a Santa. We have Santa Claus. His name is Amu Noruz. Amu Noruz. Amu means uncle. So Amu Noruz, listen to, listen to what he sounds like. He wears a felt hat and a long blue coat, cloak. Hmm. He has a walking cane and, of course, big old bag of gifts for kids. 
So uh, growing up, I got to celebrate Christmas and Noruz, and I asked my mom why there was a Santa and why there was an Amu Noruz. And she's like, well, you know, honey, Santa can't make it to everybody in the world. So Amu Noruz, his cousin, said he would cover all the kids in Western Asia and Santa would take care of everybody else. And you just kind of fell into the loophole. And little me was like, yay! Yeah, down with the system. I get two Christmases. I'm not going. I'm not going to point out this loophole to either of them. It's <laughs> their fault for mismanaging their routes. That sounds like <laughs> a good way to get on the naughty list. <laughs> Shh, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything. Sure. <laughs> Before Amonoru's ever even shows up, there is another character that comes in and gets everybody hyped for spring. Oh no. His name is Haji Firuz. So he wears all red and he has a tambourine and he's the one who kind of parades in the streets announcing for everybody to get ready for the coming of spring and the arrival of Noru's. And this is a wildly energetic character. If you weren't excited for the new year before, by the time he's finished dancing and singing, you are going to be up on your feet and excited. Um, he's in charge of beginning the celebrations leading up to the new year. And when they celebrate in Iran, he's always part of the parade. So they do have parades in Iran, and Haji Firuz is a huge part of it. That's uh, where the that's the role that all the extroverts in your family were born to play. <laughs> I guess so. Half of my family's extroverts. <laughs> um, now I do have to bring this up. This is a touchy topic, um, but I don't think we should shy away from it. There is some controversy about the character of Haji Firuz. Mm -hmm. So I want you to listen to this. Um, I mentioned before that he wears red and he carries a tambourine. Um, well, the people who dress up as him also put ash on, the, on their face. So as a kid, my parents didn't tell me about Haji Firuz. And when the Iranians got to celebrate, sometimes one of them would dress up as Haji Firuz. And I always thought, huh, why is there ash on your face? That's kind of weird. And oh, my they little, would actually put it on? They would actually put ash on their face. And so uh. little kid me thought, oh, Hachi Firuz, because he jumps around so much, he spent a lot of time jumping over those Trashev Suri fires, and he got ash on himself. Uh, but then I got older, and I learned a little thing that people used to do called blackface. And, dude, it... Mm. It felt like people a, still do that. People still do that. And <laughs> it really felt like a punch to the gut when I learned about it, because, you know, this is a holiday that's close to my heart. And so to find out that it has a potential dark side to it made me really yeah, depressed. I bet. And I was ashamed of it. And I, I didn't like bringing Haji Firuz up when people asked me about Noruz. And, you know, I had a bit more perspective now for why my parents never told me about him or acknowledged him because they were also like, ooh, that's, we don't want to touch that. Um, so for this podcast, I said, okay, I'm going to sit down and do my research. I'm going to get to the bottom why Haji Firuz is depicted like this because part of me really wanted to believe that little Sarah was right and it's just because Haji Firuz is jumping around fires all the time. Um, Part of me really wanted to believe that little Sarah was right and there wasn't anything racist about the character. He just jumped over fires and got too much soot on himself. Santa does climb through chimneys and, and for like Christmas. Is there anything similar to that for Amonaruz? Um, he doesn't climb through chimneys, no. He just kind of shows up at your door, knocks on the door and hands the gifts. Like, you know. ah. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, I looked up and a lot of sources said that the character Haji Firuz is supposed to be a black man. And based off of the lyrics of a popular Haji Firuz song, Amu Noruz is his master. Mm. Yeah. That's, um, so that's not good. And not okay. Just very not okay. Mm -hmm. um, now I did find some sources that said, oh, he's portraying a Zoroastrian firekeeper and who is covered in soot. But that there were way more sources saying the former rather than the latter. And even my mom, when I was talking to her about it, she gently told me it was because he was black. And she said this in a very bless your heart tone. You know. Yeah. Uh, and I have seen people become more aware of the problems surrounding blackface. 
And I'm seeing more and more that people will dress as hajifirus and they won't put ash on their face. And a lot of Noru's videos aimed at kids that they don't have hajifirus dressed that way. So I think people are realizing how messed up that is, how wrong it is, and they're weeding it out. Uh, it does remain a pretty sensitive subject to this day, but, you know, at least everyone listening to this podcast is a bit more informed about it. Mm -hmm. So... It... <sighs> It's terrible, but at least people are acknowledging it now. Yeah, it's it's not something we can ignore. We have to admit that this we have happened. To, exactly. In order for us to improve, we have to admit when something is wrong. It does no good sweeping it under the rug. Mm. On a lighter note, uh, Aminorus has a wife. Oh, like yes. a Mrs. Claus? It is like a Mrs. Claus. Her name is Nana Sarma, also known as Grandmother Frost. And they actually have a depressing story compared to uh, Santa Claus and his wife. Because Santa Claus and his wife get to live together on the North Pole. Amunurus and Nana Sarma can only meet once a year. And that's it. Is it on Nuruz? It's on Nuruz. So the story says that Nana Sarma spends her time leading up to the day of their meeting by cleaning their house, setting up the fire, and preparing food and everything for Amunurus. And with all that preparation, she tires herself out. And every year, by the time Amunoruz comes to her house, she's fast asleep. And him being a sweetheart doesn't want to wake her. So he will eat the food that she prepared and keep the fire burning. And uh, right before he leaves, he'll leave a flower next to her before he goes. That's beautiful. <laughs> And oh by the time she God. wakes up, he's gone. This is the same holiday with the blackface character? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's very... Um, it's romantic. Kind of, it's romantic and it's sad at the same time because they never get to be together. Oh, that is really sad. Yeah. Now, I guess it's because, you know, it's spring now. There's no frost He, he is spring and she is winter. Yeah. They can't exist together unless you're in the south unless you're in mississippi where it seems like <laughs> they they fight to see who always can... together no i'm gonna stick around for another three months you could also argue that it's persephone who's had a fight with her mom and said i'm going back to my husband hades <laughs> um but going back to this there are some people who say that if Amunoruz and Nana Sarma ever do meet, it's going to signify the end of the world or the apocalypse. Oh, what? I'm going to guess it's like global warming or something. I what don't know. the heck? Yeah, they should never meet because if they do, it's going to symbolize the end of times. <laughs> How did he marry her without meeting her? It's a good question. It's a myth, Seth. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> this raises some very concerning questions. <laughs> So we talked about the characters around Noruz, we talked about the haft scene, and these are very similar to Christmas. The last and most important way that the two holidays are linked is that it is a time for family. And that also kind of ties it into being similar to Thanksgiving. There's so, a lot of eating involved in so Noruz. So much eating involved. Especially on Seas de Bidar. Yes. So we'll get to Seas de Bidar in a bit. Um, but let's go back to the actual Noruz day. When the time for the new year is close, everyone gathers together with their families around the haft scene. And once the new year's arrives, whenever that time is, you know, could be four in the morning, could be three in the afternoon. Uh, everyone says, E de Shoma Mubarak, or they'll say, Sale Shoma Mubarak. Now I'm told the latter is the more Persian phrase. The former is the more Arabic phrase. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then if you really want to get as pure Persian as possible, you can say Noruz Piruz. Uh, people exchange gifts and they eat food together. Uh, traditional New Year's dishes can be Sabzi Polo, Kuku Mahi. We had this. Sabzi Polo is basically rice with herbs. Uh, really good herbs, though. It's like green onions and parsley and, and all this really strong stuff that you're not really sure how it's going to taste together, but... It just melts like butter in your mouth. <laughs> and you do add butter to the rice, yes. too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and saffron. saffron. Hey. <laughs> hey. And then kuku is kind of like a vegetable quiche. And mahi is basically fish. Some people will also eat lorma sabzi, which is like a braise of herbs and meat that you put over rice. 
And the significance of both of these dishes is that, is that they are green, which is the color of the new spring, and it's good luck to eat them because they are green. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of dancing, and there's a lot of partying on that first day. And then for the next 13 days, you go to visit family members, or if they're too far away, you call them, hmm. or you FaceTime with them. <laughs> um, now, there are superstitions following those first few days of spring. However you behave, and whatever your habits are, are going to impact what the rest of your year is going to be like. If you are positive and you are generous and you speak kind words, you're going to have a good year. If you're mean-spirited and greedy and you say cruel things, you're going to have a bad year. So you want to be on your best behavior? You better be that good behavior, you know, so that you can have a good year overall. Yeah. No one likes a rotten attitude. <laughs> uh, the 13th day... This is that one you were talking about earlier, is Seize the Bedad. So, my favorite part. <laughs> this is your favorite part? Yeah, this is my favorite part. Yeah. So on this day, this is where you disassemble your half scene. You take out uh, the sabze, the wheatgrass that you've been growing, and you go on a picnic. Yeah, so, real quick. Can we yeah. go over the pronunciation real quick? I feel like yeah. I've been saying it wrong all this time. I always say Seize the Bedad, but... That was very close. So the first part is seize de. So it okay. That's seize how I've been de saying it wrong. Be da. Seize de bedar. Yes. Seize de bedar. And seize de means thirteen. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I mentioned that we're going on a picnic. Can you think of a American holiday we haven't mentioned yet where people go on picnics? Hmm. Fourth of July, Arbor Day. Mm hmm. Also Memorial Day. Yeah, yeah. So people go out for Arbor Day. People go out for Memorial Day. It's considered good luck to spend your day outdoors on this 13th day of spring and to go and spend time with nature. So a lot of people will gather with family and friends and they'll spend the whole day outside. Now, here in the U.S., we don't really get the day off and usually the 13th day lands in the middle of the, the week. So we'll usually we'll celebrate it the weekend of Sis de Badar. But yeah, uh, here in the U.S., everyone brings food. Sometimes we'll play soccer, and it's a great time. Um, also, do you remember how I told you we take the sabze with us? Mm hmm So it turns out that while the sabze was growing in our home, it was pulling in all the ill omens and the poor health out of our home. Didn't we just spend like a month cleaning all that out? Well, he, it's got to get rid of the excess. There's only so much a human can do. we got to let nature help oh. us out, too. We, so right. we just need to plant more wheatgrass, is what you're saying, and then our house will be clean? No, that's not how it works, because eventually you have to throw it out, okay? Uh -huh. So it's been collecting all the ill omens and the poor health, and then you throw the sabze into a lake or a river, and that purifies the bad luck that you accumulate. Take that lake. So if you remember, the Zoroastrian view water as sacred and a purification element. Mm. So you throw it in the water, the water's going to purify all of your bad omens and stuff. Uh, another th cool thing is that single people will tie a knot in the grass as they wish that they will find a partner that year. Before you ask, yes, before we got married, I was tying knots in the sabze, hoping that we'd get married. <laughs> so... You and I just finished celebrating Noru's, and you told me that you make a wish when you tie the knots in, in the grass. In more modern days, some people, just for the fun of it, will tie it and just make a wish. In the old days, they would... Uh, single they, single would ladies? Single. All the single ladies? All the single ladies. Um, here's another thing. You, you should never, ever, ever touch someone else's sabze. Because remember, it's filled with all the ill omens and the bad health from that household. So if you touch their sabze, you're inviting those ill omens into your own household. I've touched your mom's sabze on her half scene so many times. You're part of that household. It's fine. Oh, okay. You're part of our house. So you're that's my sabze. Home. No. Okay, listen. You just have so much bad luck. Oh. Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's just make a rule here. Don't touch the grass. Okay. Okay? I won't you can touch, touch the grass. You can touch the grass that's growing in our home. Don't touch anyone else's grass. Can I touch grass. your grass? It's our grass. Oh, it's from our, our home. Grass. Okay. Um, what about the grass that's growing outside? Did you grow it? No. Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that, you've properly welcomed in the new year. 
Now, what I've shared on this podcast is just a little bit of the celebrations. This is how the Persians celebrated. So depending on what part of the world you're from or even where you are in America, you might celebrate differently. And people of different countries have different customs and different ways of celebrating Noruz, and there's different beliefs behind each of these rituals. But at the core of it all, it's a time of new beginnings. It's a time of new hope. And Noruz has already passed by the time we've posted this episode. But um, I hope everyone had a wonderful Noruz. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to celebrating with everyone next year. I will say that this has been kind of our first real celebration of Noruz now that you and I have been married. Mm-hmm. But, but it is definitely our first Noruz after being married. I would say it's probably been my favorite so far. <laughs> I miss celebrating uh, Cis de Bedar with everybody back home, but... Yeah, we weren't able nice. to do it this year. Now that we've finished our main segment, I say we move on to questions and further research. I like it. Let's go. So, first off, uh, someone asked, was Ferdowsi a Zoroastrian? Hmm. Good question. Ferdowsi was not Zoroastrian. He was Muslim. Huh. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting to know that despite his religion... He thought it was so important to keep alive the traditions and culture of another religion. Um, You know, I've always kind of, I guess he knew that knowledge of all sorts was important. You know, he fought against his fellow Muslims to get the work published. So I imagine being a heretic, being called a heretic by people of his own faith stung a bit, but he stuck with it. He thought it was really important that we kept it. So. Yeah, kind of makes um, him getting snubbed by the king a little bit harsher. Yeah. But I guess he knew it was a little bit above just being paid. Yeah, it it was it was really important. Hmm. I'm still I'm still so glad that he did it. Yes, I'm sure everybody is. <laughs> okay. Uh, someone asked, did Jamshid make the Jami Jam his uh, his seven ring cup of immortality or? <laughs> Was it given to him? What, what was it? What was the nature of this artifact? Mm, so I did research on this, and there was nothing concise. Some sources said he devised the cup, and he kept the knowledge to himself, so no one else could make one. Thanks, Jamshid. Yeah, thanks, Jamshid. We could have used that. Um, some say that Ahura Mazda gave it to him. Some say that he stole it from Ahriman himself, and. Ahriman had once used it to spy on the world, but once Jamshid took it from him, uh, he lost even more influence over the world. Hmm. Some folks asked, oh yeah, do people still hunt with cheetahs? <laughs> That's something that was absol- that absolutely astonished me from the last episode. Oh, I know That it. I feel like we could have followed up more on. Well, the answer is no. Cheetahs' numbers have declined drastically, so the sport has completely disappeared. Um, historically, this kind of hunting actually began in Egypt. It was not originally a Persian hunting technique. It was an Egyptian hunting technique. So wait, are there cheetahs in Egypt? Uh, There used to be. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was introduced to Persia from there, and then it finally moved to India. Now, the method of cheetah hunting is not to raise them as cubs, but what you do is you capture them as a wild adult who has already developed their hunting skills, And you keep them blindfolded like you would a hawk. You give them basic training to follow certain commands. And when it comes time for the hunt, you take off the blindfold and you release them. Um, But again, cheetahs are so low in numbers, the practice isn't done anymore. Hmm. I will also say in the past one, I I said that they were timid. They're timid because they're in captivity. A wild cheetah is very aggressive. And honestly, cheetahs in captivity, have they have the sort of aggression that a cornered animal or animal with high anxiety would have just because they're timid creatures that need a dog companion doesn't mean they're a good pet don't own cheetahs guys but yeah hunting with cheetahs is just not a good idea anymore because they just have such low numbers these days yeah they're an endangered species it's probably super illegal to have one in a lot of those countries it it should be super illegal everywhere in my personal opinion Mm. but that's me going off on a tangent that, I think that was the last question we had, so... I've now we question. begin our next big segment, our new one. Roll for wisdom, Seth. What'd you learn? I found a really interesting video on Zoroastrianism by a uh, YouTube channel called uh, 
I think it's pronounced cogito or cogito. How's it spelled? Uh, C O G I T O. We'll okay. link to the video on our Twitter. Oh yeah, we can it's do that. It's a very good video. Uh, he makes these interesting animated videos about different world religions. He's got one on Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism. Mm. Uh, there are these uh, really funny... T <laughs> well, I, I say comedy isn't really the focus, but they're very informative while still being entertaining. But uh, he had this to kind of say about uh, the Towers of Silence, which we've covered on a couple episodes Oh, yes. Uh, so we mentioned in our last episode that uh, the Towers of Silence have either been illegalized or made difficult to use by the fact that countries where uh, uh, Zoroastrianism is still practiced uh, have dwindling numbers of carrion birds in, yeah. in major metropolitan areas, partly due to just people encroaching on their habitats. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of these, a lot of Zoroastrians have been finding very smart ways to comply with the, uh, with not having a body contaminate the elements mm -hmm. by finding alternate ways to, to cremate, uh, okay. dead bodies. Now, hold on. You said cremation. When I think cremation, I, I immediately think setting a body on fire. That's a big no-no. So cremation is interesting. It's not necessarily about converting the body to ash. Uh, these cremation tactics are more about uh, drawing all of the water out of a uh, out of my body, oh. evenly to the point where it crumbles to dust. Oh, and they've come, they, they've come across this in a few different methods that are pretty interesting. I'm a is one of them drinking from the wrong cup when you're searching for the Holy Grail. <laughs> is that an Indiana Jones reference? Maybe. <laughs> Immediately what I thought of when you said drawing That's all That's two the... <laughs> Holy Grail references in two episodes. <laughs> okay, uh, so some of these options involve uh, cremation by electrical heating elements. That is to say, it's, it's similar to a standard cremation oven, but flame never directly contacts the, the human body. Huh. Okay. Uh, they put them in this oven and basically... It's like putting a uh, a piece of jerky or a piece of meat into an oven to make it into jerky, mm -hmm. except you keep doing it until the jerky falls to ash <laughs> at the bottom of the oven. Fire so, never directly touches it. Yeah, it's just it really just hot in out. there, and it stays in there for a long time. Okay. Uh, this has been pretty popular in in uh, for with Zoroastrians in India because it's a very uh, environmentally friendly cremation option mm -hmm. it produces less it doesn't produce smoke mm -hmm. which is i mean you know smoke is kind of a a no-no kind of a bad symbol in zoroastrianism so that's a, mm -hmm. a plus <laughs> uh and well while it does still produce co2 emissions it's significantly less than a traditional flame furnace for mm -hmm. disposing of bodies um Kind of, kind of another me method of cremation that I thought was very interesting is uh, they're setting up these solar collectors, which is basically oh. an array of, of reflective mirrors and lenses that focuses the sun to where the dead body is and basically does the same thing, but over a longer span of time because it requires the sun to be used, you know? Well, if you think about it as the, the amount of time it takes for the body to disintegrate, I imagine it takes a similar amount of time if you put it on a tower of silence. Well, actually, uh, I did a little research on that. Apparently, with enough carrion birds, uh, a flock of buzzards could take a corpse and strip it down in a matter of like half an hour. Wow, really? Yeah, and leave the bones sitting there. Wow. Now, it takes a while for the bones to disappear, but... Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, Those are some hard-working birds. One of, the, one of the simpler options I found out about is uh, a lot of Zoroastrian church areas with high populations of Zoroastrians mm -hmm. have taken to using these above-ground mausoleums for ah, burials. Not contaminating the earth. Right, because it's above ground and it's just in a little shack on a piece <laughs> of land somewhere. <laughs> well, it's just, I say shack. The The mausoleums that I saw photos of were actually very pretty. Oh. They, they've got um, images of uh, the Farvahar and, and, and excerpts from the Avesta and oh, stuff like so that. Oh, that's awesome. It's, yes, they're very pretty. Um, 
but that that's kind of one of the simpler options. Uh, the mausoleums are remind me of a lot of uh, those cemeteries that you see in New Orleans, oh, where yeah. they do a lot of the above ground burials. They do. But yeah, um, either the body crumbles away from having no moisture content left inside, mm -hmm. or we just keep it where it's not touching any of the elements <laughs> ever. Which is really the the big thing that they were going for when they were disposing of their bodies. Mm -hmm. All right. With that, I think we'll conclude our episode for today. Uh, Seth, when we last read the, about the Shahnameh, do you remember what I said about Persia facing some dark times? Yeah, because Jamshid was being an idiot. <laughs> he was. He let it all go to his head. So the next episode, we're going to talk about the rise of the Serpent King. And we're going to debut the hero that my brother was named after. Want to keep up with us? You can follow us on Twitter at Mazandercast. That's M-A-Z-A-N-D-E-R. C-A-S-T. We will announce our next episode through our Twitter, so spread the word. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions on current and future episodes. If there's any topics you'd like us to cover or stories you want to share with us, then email us at mazandercast at gmail.com. Same spelling as our Twitter. Special thanks to Dr. Lynn for our cover art. Check out more of her work at lorrainelynn.com. That's L O R R A I N E L I N dot com. We thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope you'll stick around for more in the future. As always, we hope you'll have good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. Hold on,